Okay, welcome back to Wonder. We are on chap or page 100. Chapter's called Breakfast. Can you pick me up from school today? I said the next morning, smearing some cream cheese on my bagel. Mm. Mom was making August lunch. American cheese on whole wheat bread, soft enough for Augie to eat, while August sat eating oatmeal at the table. Dad was getting ready to go to work. Now that I was in high school, the new school routine was going to be that Dad and I would take the subway together in the morning, which meant his having to leave 15 minutes earlier than usual. Then I'd get off at my stop and he'd keep going. And Mom was going to pick me up after school in the car. I was going to call Miranda's mother to see if she could drive you home again, Mom answered. No, Mom, I said quickly. You pick me up or I'll just take the subway. You know I don't want you to take the subway by yourself yet, she answered. Mom, I'm 15. Everybody my age takes the subway by themselves. She can take the subway home, said Dad from the other room, adjusting his tie as he stepped into the kitchen. Why can't Miranda's mother just pick her up again, Mom argued with him. She's old enough to take the subway by herself, Dad insisted. Mom looked at both of us. Is something going on? She didn't address her question to either one of us in particular. You would know if you had come back to check on me, I said spitefully, like you said you would. Oh, goodness, Via, said Mom, remembering now that she had completely ditched me last night. She put down the knife she was using to cut Augie's grapes in half, still a choking hazard for him because of the size of his palate. Remember, the palate is the roof of his mouth. Um, I am so sorry. I fell asleep in Augie's room by the time I woke up. I know, I know, I nodded indifferently. Mom came over, put her hands on my cheeks, and lifted my face to look at her. I'm really, really sorry, she whispered. I could tell she was. It's okay, I said. Via, Mom, it's fine. This time I meant it. She looked so genuinely sorry that I, I just wanted to let her off the hook. She kissed and hugged me, then returned to the grapes. So is something going on with Miranda, she asked. Just that she's acting like a complete jerk, I said. Miranda's not a jerk, Augie quickly chimed in. She can be, I yelled. Believe me. Okay, then, I'll pick you up. No problem, Mom said, decisively sweeping the half grapes into a s snack bag with the side of her knife. That was the plan all along anyway. I'll pick up Augie from school in the car, and then we'll pick you up. We'll probably get there about quarter to four. No, I said firmly before she even finished. Isabel, she can take the subway said dad impatiently she's a big girl now she's reading war and peace for crying out loud what does war and peace have to do with anything answered mom clearly annoyed it means you don't have to pick her up in the car like she's a little girl he said sternly via are you ready get your bag and let's go i'm ready i said pulling on my backpack bye mom bye augie i kissed them both quickly and headed toward the door do you even have a metro card? Mom said after me. Of course she has a metro card, answered Dad, fully exasperated. Yeesh, Mama. Stop worrying so much. Bye, he said, kissing her on the cheek. Bye, big boy, he said to August, kissing him on the top of his head. I'm proud of you. Have a good day. Bye, Daddy, you too. Dad and I jogged down the stoop stairs and headed down the block. Call me after school before you get on the subway, Mom yelled. Oh, Call me after school before you get on the subway, Mom yelled at me from the window. I didn't even turn around but waved my hand at her so she know, she'd know I heard her. Dad did turn around, walking backwards for a few steps. War and peace, Isabel, he called out, smiling as he pointed at me. War and peace. Genetics 101. Genetics. Both sides of Dad's family were Jews from Russia and Poland. Papa's grandparents fled the pogroms and ended up in New York City at the turn of the century. Tata's parents fled the Nazis and ended up in Argentina in the 40s. Papa and Tata met at a dance on the Lower East Side while she was in town visiting a cousin. They got married and moved to Bayside and had Dad and Uncle Ben. Mom's side of the family is from Brazil, except for her mom. 
my beautiful grands and her dad augusto who died before i was born the rest of mom's family all her glamorous aunts uncles and cousins still live in alto lebanon a ritzy suburb south of the of rio grands and augusto moved to boston in the early 60s and had mom and aunt kate who may, who's married to uncle porter oh my word um i did not know what what this word was so i looked it up and this is how it's set. This is how they say it. Pogrom. And so it says, Papa's grandparents fled the pogroms and ended in ended up in New York City at the turn of the century. Pogrom is an organized massacre of helpless people. Massacre means they just go in and kill a bunch of people. So the people don't defend themselves. Somebody just goes in and kills them. That's crazy. That changes the way I read it. So Papa's grandparents fled the programs or the massacres and ended up in New York City at the turn of the century. That's a pretty big deal, right? Because if they would have been massacred, then Augie would never have been born, right? Okay. Um... Mom and Dad met at Brown University and have been together ever since. Isabel and Nate, like two peas in a pod, they moved to New York right after college, had me a few years later, then moved to a brick townhouse in North River Heights, the hippie stroller capital of the upper, upper Manhattan, when I was about one years old, or about a year old. Not one person in the exotic mix of my family, Jean Poole, has ever shown any obvious signs of having what August has. I poured over grainy, grainy sepia pictures. Remember the sepia I said was yesterday? That picture that looked kind of like, like almost a pinkish orangey cast color? Okay, sepia. Pictures of long dead relatives and babushkas. Babushka, um... Like, Patricia Polacco used to call her um, grandmother Babushka. I think it was the the clothing, though. Um, Babushka's black and white snapshots of distant cousins in crisp white linen suits, soldiers in uniform, ladies with beehive hairdos. Beehive hairdos were hairdos that like, went really high up. Um... Polaroids of bell-bottom teenagers and long-haired hippies. And not once have I been able to detect even the slightest trace of August's face in their faces. Oops. Not one. But after August was born, my parents underwent genetic counseling. They were told that August had what seemed to be a previously unknown type of mandibular facial Ditosis, dystosis, mandibular facial, so it had to do with the face, right? Dystosis, caused by an autismal recessive mutation in the TCOF1 gene, which is located on chromosome 5, complicated by a hemofacial microsomia characteristic of the OVA, OAV spectrum. Sometimes these mutations occur during pregnancy. Sometimes they're inherited from one parent carrying the dominant gene. Sometimes they're caused by the interaction of many genes, possibly in combination with environmental factors. This is called multifactorial inheritance. In August's case, the doctors were able to identify one of the single nucleotide deletion mutations that made war on his face. The weird thing is, though you'd never know it from looking at them, both my parents carry that mutant gene, and I carry it too. What it means is, if the bad gene in somebody links up with the bad gene in somebody else, what happens to Augie can happen to somebody. Now, because his sister carries the gene, 
um, her kids have a possibility of having the same thing happen to their face. But it means that whoever she has babies with, if she has babies, has to have the same gene also for it to be wonky-do. Okay? The Punnett square. Or, oh, sorry, the Punnett square. If I have children, there is a one in two chance that I will pass on the defective gene to them. That doesn't mean they'll look like August, but they'll carry the gene that got the got double dosed in August and helped make him the way he is. If I marry someone who has the same defective gene, there's a one in two chance that our children that our kids will carry the gene and look totally normal. There's a one in four chance that our kids will not carry the gene at all and a one in four chance that our kids would look like August. So if she, ha if she has babies with somebody who has the same gene, there's a one in four chance they're not going to have the gene. Um, a one in two chance they'll carry it and look totally normal, and a one in four chance that the kids will not carry the gene at all, or that they'll look like August. If August has children with somebody who doesn't have a trace of the gene, there's a 100% probability their kids will inherit the gene, but a 0% chance that their kids will have a double dose of it like August, which means they'll carry the gene no matter what, but they could look totally normal. If he marries someone who has the gene, their kids will have the same odds my, as my kids. This only explains the part of August that's explainable. There's that other part of his genetic makeup that's not inherited, but just incredibly bad luck. Countless do doctors have drawn a little tic-tac-toe grids for my parents over the years to try to explain the genetic lottery to them. Geneticists used these punnett squares to determine inheritance, recessive and dominant genes, probabilities and chance. But for all they know, there's more they don't know. They can try to forecast the odds, but they can't guarantee them. They use terms like germline mosaicum, chromosome rearrangement or delayed mutation to explain why their science is not an exact science. I actually like how doctors talk. I like the sound of science. I like how words you don't understand explain things you can't understand. There are countless people under words like germline, germline mosaicum, chromosome rearrangement, or delayed mutation. Countless babies who will never be born like mine.